Acts chapter 10, and I want to read one verse, verse 38, as we get started this morning. Acts 10, 38, and just keep your Bible open as we're going to go to other places today. Acts 10, 38, the Bible says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with Him. Will you pray with me and pray for me as we get into the Word today. Father, we thank You for Your Word. Lord, we thank You that it's alive. Help me pray this morning, church. Lord, we thank You that it's powerful. God, we thank You that it's true. God, we thank You that it's active and it has the ability to change our hearts and it has the ability to change our lives. Lord, I pray today for that anointing that we spoke about, Lord, that runs off of Jesus. Lord, let it run onto the body. Lord, You said that Your anointing destroys the yoke. It destroys, Lord, everything that would keep us bound and discouraged and trapped and oppressed. Lord, I just yield my life to You today and I pray that You would use me for Your service and for Your glory. That it wouldn't be just words that we say, but it would be power and it would be strength and it would be life and it would result, Lord, in the salvation, in the victory, and the freedom of Your people today. We ask these things together, Lord, in one mind and in one heart and in one accord. We ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. And amen. I'm, I want to speak to you a message this morning entitled Overcoming Oppression. Overcoming Oppression. I believe that there are many believers that oppression defines their life. They're weary, they're discouraged. A lot of times they feel trapped. A lot of times they're up one moment, they're down the next, and they walk in a lot of condemnation, a lot of guilt, a lot of shame. A lot of people are okay as long as they're at church, as long as they're in the altar, as long as they're surrounded by people that believe what they believe. And maybe the other people that they're around are a little bit stronger in the Lord than they are, and they're able to lift them up. They're, they're, they have a little bit more consistency Consistency in their life than, than the, the weaker believers. And, and so they feel good when they're at church, but as soon as church is over, here comes the oppressive lies of the enemy. Here comes the weight of the enemy. Here comes the agenda of the enemy that would say, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was fun for you while you're at church. Now it's back to reality. Now it's to that place of discouragement and, and depression. And as long as we walk in that, y'all, if that's you, then you've got to acknowledge that. Because as long as we walk in that, we'll never be the light or the power or the influence that God has called us to be in the world that we live in. I want to draw a, a line of distinction between possession and oppression. All right, it, it is my belief, it is the teaching of the Bible that children of God cannot be possessed by the devil. Right? There, there's doctrines going around. There's special preachers, special believers that are able to cast demons out of believers. I don't believe that. Do you honestly believe that the Holy Spirit of God dwells inside of you and the devil's going to come and say to him, move over, Holy Spirit. I'm going to take control of this person for a while. Absolutely not. The Bible says that if you're saved, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That seal is a protectant. That seal, it's like the sealing of an envelope. Like when you lick it before you, you close that. There's nothing that can get in there. It can't be opened up. It's also like the seal of a, like around a fruit, like the seal of an orange. That as long as that, that seal, that, that peeling, peeling is around that fruit, then it's preserved and it's kept. And the only way that it can be spoiled is for that seal to be 
opened up. So believers are not possessed by the devil. There are people in the world that are possessed by the devil. There's people in the world that uh, have bags and bags of prescriptions from the doctor trying to treat this ailment and this problem and this and that and the other. When the problem is they're possessed, they're antagonized, or either they're oppressed by the devil and they either need to get saved or they need to find their way out of that depression, fear, and anxiety and begin to walk out of that valley and walk on the higher ground with the Lord. Everything that goes on in your life cannot be solved by a prescription pill. It's going to be solved when you get on the, in the will of God for your life and you begin to walk with Jesus in the victory that He died to bring you. Possession. If you're possessed by the devil, that means ownership. That means I own you. I, I make you do everything that I want you to do. I live inside of you. I have absolute power and control over your life. No matter how you want to get free. I believe a lot of people that are on drugs or have been on drugs, they are possessed by devils. When you look in the Word of God, you find in the end times, uh, I mean in the end of the book of Revelation, it talks about witchcraft and sorcery. If you break that word down in the Greek, you find the word pharmakeia, which is where they get the word pharmacy, pharmaceutical drugs. Anytime that you're smoking drugs, doing drugs, shooting drugs, you're opening yourself up to the spirit world. That's why people see things and hallucinate. People, Their mind gets damaged and it's not just an addiction to drugs. There's an addiction to sex. There's addiction to stealing. There's addiction to lying. All of that you open yourself up to when you dab in that spirit world. People are possessed by the devil. The only thing that can possess, that can free people that are possessed by the devil, it's not a psychiatrist and it's not a prescription pill. It's the power of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He breaks every chain and He sets the captive free. That's why the church has to make absolute, it has to be our absolute resolve to preach the Word of God. To preach thus saith the Lord. Because the problems y'all in our community, the problems in our world, they are spiritual in nature. And they have to have a spiritual answer. They have to be answered with the Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But oppression, oppression is a little bit different. God's people can be oppressed. I didn't realize it until I plugged that word into Strong's Concordance. How many times the word oppressed is mentioned or written in a King James Bible over and over? Do you know that's what was going on in Egypt when God's people were slaves to the Egyptian? They were oppressed by the Egyptians. Their identity was the people of God, but the reality of their life was not the people of God. The reality of their life, it was slavery. It was bondage. When Jesus come on the scene in the Scripture that we read in Acts 10, 38, He came to heal all who were oppressed by the devil. The word oppressed, it means to be held down. It means to be weighted down. This boy is a child of God. If I'm the devil, I can't get inside of this boy and use him for my purpose. But if this boy gets down, lay down. <laughs> All right? If he gets discouraged, this is where the devil wants you, right? He wants you down. He wants you discouraged. He wants you looking at all that's going on around you rather than looking to the cross where Jesus defeated all these devils, all these demons, all these lies. He wants you not looking at the love of Abba, but looking at the people that have rejected you and said you're not enough. And what you're doing, you're shrieking. You're forgetting that victory. You're you're letting this world be your reality rather than the truth that you're a part of a kingdom that's never ever going to be shaken. It's the kingdom of God. And, and when you're looking at that, man, that feels good just saying that, don't it? Man, I'm a citizen of another country. I'm just passing through. I'm not home yet. I know I'm going to be mistreated on this earth. But where I'm going, everybody acts like me. Everybody runs and shouts and rejoices and cries and speaks in a funny language they don't understand. All that goes on in the city where I'm going. But you get your eyes off of the gospel 
you'll find yourself down in the low place. And don't think it can't happen to you. I remember hearing a message one time about David being in <coughs> Ziklag. You know, Ziklag was in a low place in the earth. It was in a depression. David spent, it was either 16 or 18 months out of the will of God, living in Ziklag, fighting a battle he never should have been a part of. And in that, what happened to him? He lost, he lost everything that mattered to him. It, 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 it affected David, but not only did it affect David, it affected other people. He was oppressed by the enemy. He's weighted down. So if the devil can get you in that low, discouraged place, then he wants to oppress you. He'll just sit down on top of it. Right? This boy may be strong. He might be able to run and to take off and do but not with a 200 pound man, and not with a 200 pound devil sitting up. Now, praise the Lord now, Carter. <laughs> Preach from your Bible now, Carter. Encourage them. That's what oppression is like. That's what oppression does to people, and it keeps people down, and it robs their joy, and it looks silly in the natural. But I'm telling you, it's the reality in the spiritual. Children of God have got a devil sitting right on their chest that is oppressing them, keeping them silent to sit down upon you. If your Christian life is miserable, you are oppressed. Some entire churches are oppressed. I've walked into places sometimes. I remember going one time to a church in Nepal that I was to preach at. It was so dark in that region, y'all. People were so afraid. There's no praise in that place. There's, there's no amen. There's no shout of victory. There's no triumph. You could just feel the weight and even the mockery of the enemy that you go into a place like that and you try to preach faith. There, there have been individuals that I've gone to in my life that I know they're in trouble spiritually. They're drowned and, and you go into them, to them with the word from God and after you You've, you've preached your best sermon, all they want to talk about. Well, brother, you just don't understand what I... And the problem is the devil has got you blinded that you're not hearing what God is saying. But all you hear are the lies and the taunts of the enemy. And the only way that you're going to get out of that place of oppression is you've got to believe what God says. And even when you don't feel like it, even when it don't look like it, you've got to put one foot in front of the other and take one step of faith at a time, and before you know it, you're out of that valley, and you're on the mountaintop with God. And the devil doesn't look so big from heaven's point of view. The valley doesn't look so low from heaven's point of view. The mountain doesn't look so big when you realize I'm seated with Christ in heavenly places, and this victory has already been won. If you're oppressed, you lose your worship and you lose your praise and you lose your desire for God and for His Word. One word that's kin to oppression, its first cousin, is depression. It really means the same thing. Weighted down. You know what depression does to people? It paralyzes them. You ever had a whole list of stuff you needed to do? But it's easier just to roll over in the bed and turn the alarm off and just lay there all day and do nothing. And when you choose to do that, you, you may not realize it, but it's like you're in quicksand and you're not staying still. You're sinking lower and lower and lower. Now I'm depressed. I'm, I was oppressed. That gave way to depressed. And now I'm seeking, and in that the devil will cover you with shame and with guilt. I can tell you, sitting still and doing nothing, you're opening the door for shame and guilt and every other kind of demon to come into your life. And the last place you're going to be found is worshiping and praising Jesus because He's worthy. You're just going to be there magnifying your problem. And if you're not careful... You'll give way to a victim mentality in your life. And when people come and preach truth to you, you will get offended by the truth. You will distance yourself from the people that love you enough to tell you what the Bible says and you will surround yourself with people that are victims of the devil just like you are. 
And they'll pat you on the back and they will always magnify the problem to be greater than Jesus is to be the answer to your problem. Be careful. Be careful in that because from that place of oppression, the devil can take you anywhere. He'll, he'll take you into bitterness. He'll take you into a place where you're jealous of other people who are not discouraged like you are. And also a, a, a spirit of anger will take a hold in your life. Also associated with this are suicidal spirits that I don't want to live anymore. And I don't see how things could ever get better. So I would rather just take my life. Be careful in that. This is why, y'all, praise and worship comes first. One of the greatest weapons that you have in your... I don't want to just focus on the problem. I want to tell you the cure. One of the greatest weapons that God has made. There's a reason the longest book in the Bible is the book of Psalms. The word psalm, it means a song. It's 150 chapters. It's right smack dab in the middle of the Bible. And the book of Psalms is a song book. The book of Psalms is real. Sometimes the man is on top of the mountain and he's telling other people, Hey y'all, magnify the Lord with me. Let's worship Him. And somebody get a harp. Somebody get the drums sing with me because the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever other times he's low and he says God I'm like a deer panting for streams of water I'm thirsty and I can't find you how long you're going to make me wait God how long God I hear the wicked saying I hear the enemy saying where is your God when's your God's going to show up God it's about time for you to show up and break the teeth of my enemies because I'm tired of them chewing on my life I'm tired of them chewing me up the book of Psalms is a song book and it's all to worship and praise and magnify the Lord that's your greatest weapon in the face of oppression and depression get your hands up before you feel a thing get into the altar and begin to praise the Lord Pastor Lee read to us a scripture that says says the Lord inhabits the praises of His people. That means He lives in your praise. You want God to show up? Then open up your mouth and start praising Him. Start thanking Him. If you say, well, brother, I've got nothing to be thankful for. Well, if you're saved and your name is written down in the Lamb's book of life, start there. I might be a miserable mess, but thank God I'm not going to hell and Jesus washed me of my wretched sins. And before you know it, that makes me happy, Brother Robert. Oh, God, I, I believe I could think of two or three other things to just thank Him for. And you see what you... You close the door on pity and, and whining and pouting because things, and you open the door to start seeing the goodness of God. David said in Psalms 27, I would have given up a long time ago except I believe to see the goodness of God in the land of the living. That man of God was saying, Brother Robert, faith is all that kept me going. If I'd have listened to what? he said and she said if I'd have listened to my own fear and my own heart I'd have given up a long time ago but I believe to see the goodness of God in my life and thank God no devil no doubt no oppression has taken me out of the race listen to this some people have an oppressive spirit about them and just being around them it will weigh on you like we said earlier, God uses people, but the enemy uses people. And some way, somehow, I don't know, you, you feel connected to that person and their opinion of you, it really matters. It could be in children that never really thought they were enough for their mama or for their daddy, and so they're looking for acceptance in other people. It could be from a, a girl that never thought she was pretty enough or beautiful enough. So she just goes looking for love anywhere and everywhere that she could find it. And in her spirit, she's going to be oppressed. Children are walking in oppression. And until you realize, like what the Lord said to us this morning, my love for you is perfect. And how ridiculous is it of people that will hear something like that and brush it off? It meant nothing. 
And then some measly old mortal human being will say something to us and it will cut us right to the heart and we'll walk in that shame and rejection for the, for the next 30 years because they did. When God says, my love for you is perfect. I remember preaching at Mississippi State one day and every girl that walked by didn't have enough clothes to go swimming in. And the Lord spoke to me there that day and said they're all looking for love. And the reason they're dressed like that, they're looking for attention, they're looking for affection, and what they need to know is the love that I'll have, that I have for them. You'll never know what love is until you find the love of God in the person of Jesus, until you look to the cross. God's love doesn't change. It's not about if people like you or not. It's not about how much money you got or the promotion on your job. If you want to know does God love me or not, look to the cross where He bore my sin and He shed His blood so that I could have eternal life and know the love of God and the love of the Father. Some people, some people have an oppressive spirit and you'll feel guilty by not being what they want you to be. I, I've dealt with this in my past. And I, I dealt with this a lot growing up. And it followed me into adulthood. It, this oppressive spirit, it went with me on when I went on vacation. Or when I went out of town, I felt like I needed to be somewhere else doing something else. And it just in a prayer. You can't even have a good time. You're somewhere doing something that ought to be fun. It ought to be a time of rejoicing and happiness. But your mind and your heart is somewhere else. Like, I need to be here. That person is God. Uh, they're, they're oppressing you. There's an oppressive spirit in that situation. It followed me into my marriage. And it followed me into the ministry. And God... Had to free me of this. The problem is you're looking for somebody, for someone else to be your master. People go from one abusive relationship to the next because like the Egyptians, we have the mentality of a slave because we've been one so long. People have put their oppression on us for so long that we feel connected to them. And that's the only life that we know. Look over at Romans chapter 8 and verse 13. I saw these scriptures in a in a a light that I had really never seen them before. Living after the flesh, we know and we've taught that it can be trying to please God through human efforts. Well, if I prayed hard enough or if I had a good week this week or if I witnessed to three people or if I went to the jail both times, then God will like me. But if I didn't pray very much, if I didn't go to the jail, if I didn't have a good week, now God doesn't like me. You know, if that's the way you live for God, I can tell you, you're always going to be oppressed because you're looking at yourself and your own sacrifice rather than Jesus and His sacrifice for you. Plug that into verse 13. If you live after the flesh, you shall die. Death always means separation. You try to please God by how well you're doing, you're not going to get closer. You're going to find yourself further and further away from Him. And when you do good, you're going to think God really likes you. But when you fail like everybody fails, you're going to feel like He don't like you no more. And you're not walking in His perfect love. And you'll be up and down. You'll be all around, all over the place. But if you through the Spirit... That means God's Spirit working in your life. Do put to death, mortify the deeds of the body. You will live. In, walking in the Spirit means I'm looking to Jesus and what He's done in my life. And the Holy Spirit is bringing the sword to everything that doesn't belong. And I'm getting free. He's breaking chains. He's breaking shackles. He's breaking ties to people that I don't need. People that have oppressed me. People that I thought I needed and I couldn't live without. They walked out of my life. Guess what? My heart's still beating. I still love Jesus and I'm still going forward. Don't live after the flesh. Walk in the Spirit. Look in verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are 
the sons of God. The word sons right there, it means maturity. How I can tell somebody's immature in the Lord is they're inconsistent and they're up and down and they're all over the place. And whether how they're doing today, how they worship is always predicated on, on how things are going in their life at the present moment. The Bible likens that to children that are tossed to and fro. When, when God is looking for us to be is trees planted by the rivers of water. We're rooted. We're not being tossed to and fro. If you were to cut that tree open, Sister Billy, and look at the rings that would tell you the age. There, there's even in those rings you could see that that tree went through some dry seasons. That tree went through some flood seasons. That tree might have experienced a fire. That tree might have lived through. But because it was planted by the rivers of living water, because no matter the season that I'm going through, the Spirit still flows. I'm still anointed. I'm still called. I'm still chosen. There's still a God in heaven who is for me and not against me. I'm going to keep growing and I'm going to keep moving with God. Look at here in verse 15. This is what it means, y'all, to be led by the Spirit. For you have not received the spirit of bondage that brings fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. That's the difference. When you get in trouble, you know what the enemy wants you to do? Run and hide. Because God is mad at you. Look at you. Look how pitiful you are. You don't belong with those people. You don't belong at the altar. You don't, but put, man, put your hands down. Keep your mouth shut. Who do you think you are? It's the spirit of a slave. It's the spirit of bondage that brings fear. It's the spirit that says, nothing ever good happens in my life. It's always bad. Nobody likes me. Nobody loves me. And you know where you're going? Now you're oppressed. Soon you're going to be depressed and you're going to be sinking in the mud and in the mire. You're opening the door for every evil spirit out of hell to attack your life. You'll end up jealous of people that are walking on with God and the devil will use you as his little play toy to disrupt and discourage other people around you because you'll always be talking about what they did to you rather than what Christ did has done for you and the victory that He won. Listen to this. But you have received the spirit of adoption. That spirit of adoption means you come out of one family that was not good, but you've been brought into a new family that is completely different. This family says you belong. This family says you're chosen. This family says you are enough. This family says that it's not just what we can get out of you. It's how we can serve you and encourage you and build you up. It's how that we can love you. It's in this family we don't stab each other on the back or use you as a stepping stone to get what we want. We bear one another's burdens. We lay down our life for one another. And the same love that we've been loved with, we're looking for for ways to show that same love to the world and to our brothers and sisters in Christ. And that spirit of adoption, listen, it says it cries, Abba, Father. The word Abba, it's like a special name that a child would call its father. I remember one time, this is about a mother, but it's, you know, it's a... We were, we were at the feed store one day, me and Logan. Logan was probably about Hannah's age and This girl behind the counter says to Logan, she says, Hey, is your mama named Lauren? Logan looked up at her and said, Nope, my mama's name is Mama. (laughs) My mama's name is Mama. I don't know who Lauren is. I know Mama. That's like this with with God. You can call Him all kind of names. But this writer would say, I call Him Abba. He's my Father. When I get in trouble, I don't run from Him. I call on Him. I I don't know Greek and I don't know Hebrew. I know Abba. I know God. I know Jesus. I know the Holy Ghost. I know that when I get in trouble, He's the one that I need and the one who is able to get me out. And the Bible says that it's our spirit 
It's, it's His Spirit, the Spirit of adoption that helps us to cry, Abba, Father. And the Spirit bears witness. That means the testimony of God's Spirit testifies to our Spirit that we are the children of God. If you'll listen, greater than the lies of the enemy are the truth that the Spirit will testify. You don't belong in depression. You're not what they say you are. You're a child of God. Get up and out of that place of pity and despair and discouragement and begin to praise the Lord because He is worthy and it's not here to destroy you. It's here to help you and bring you through to the other side. God says in verse 17 that if we are His children, then we're heirs and heirs of God and joint heirs of Christ. If so be that we suffer with Him, we may also be glorified together. You're an heir. That means you have an inheritance with God in Christ. That means that everything that belongs to Jesus, it belongs to you. That's how you can pray in His name. That victory that He won that we keep talking about on that cross, He didn't do it for Himself. He didn't need that. He already had that. He did it for you. That's why He came not as the Son of God, but as the Son of Man. To live right because you couldn't and then to die right because you couldn't even do that either. And He opened up a door so that every blessing, every resource, all the powers of heaven could be deposited and put into your life. But along the way, He lets you know right there, you might have to suffer with Him. You might have to suffer because of Him. Man, you'd think you get saved and you get your family in line with God that people are going to come out of the woodwork and say, I'm proud of you. Man, I'm proud of you. In this, in this world where we live, where most people are committing adultery and having affairs, homosexuality is applauded and clapped, and where kids are looking at pornography and doing drugs and on their cell phones looking at God knows what. Man, I'm proud of you. You got your family in the altar. You're filled with the Holy Ghost and you're learning the Word. That's the way it ought to be. But that ain't the reality of what's happening in this world. You'll be ashamed. You'll be an approach for the cause of Jesus Christ. And the people that ought to pat you on the back and get behind you and encourage you will be the biggest stumbling block in your path. But what you've got to do is in the anointing of the Spirit, I'm stepping over this rock. I'm stepping over that abyss. I'm going to And this is a prayer that I prayed. I'm going to heaven, Brother Robert. My sons are going to heaven. This little girl is going to heaven. My wife is going to heaven. I pray that I, uh, we're, we're going on the, on the second bus load in the rapture. That trumpet's going to sound. And can you imagine, church, you're going to see a city like you ain't never seen before. Yeah. My God, what is that? <laughs> oh, what... It's shining. If there ain't no sun, where's that light coming? Everything's perfect. There's no litter. There's no trash. The road is paved in gold. There's gates made out of a solid pearl. The walls are jeweled and jasper. And you're walking through there. There's no Simon Peter standing at the gate asking why he should let you in. I don't know who made that up. That ain't what Jesus said. As you walk through those gates, I just imagine my whole crew right here, all five of us, Pete Costello, stepping through those gates together. Can you imagine? I'm going to run. I'm going to shout. I'm going to buck. I, I told somebody yesterday it's going to be like a horse, a stud horse that's been in a stall for two months eating oats. I mean, just shouting, running, rejoicing. I made it! I made it home! And if I had to suffer on my way to get there, I can tell you what, it was all worth it. Keep stepping over them stumbling blocks. Keep walking over offenses. And who knows, you might look behind you on this pathway and some of the very ones that talked about you and ridiculed you. Jesus got a hold of their heart and you get to see it eternally with Him. Worship of God around the world. It'll happen. It will. You just have to keep moving forward. Some days you ain't going to feel like it. Do it anyway. 
I can tell you people, I know it happens. They lay in the bed, they wallow in depression, they get on social media, they spend more time on Facebook and Snapchat that they do than they do in the Word of God. If that's you, you're going to be oppressed. The enemy's going to get a hold of you. Be with God. Talk to Him. Let Him encourage your heart. I want to talk to you. What we just read in Romans 8, not, I'm kind of running out of time. we got a little time. Flip, flip with me to Exodus 15. Listen to this. Listen to this. What we read in Romans 8 is about a new identity. There, there was a man who walked into the jail yesterday. This man gave his heart to the Lord last week. I asked him how he was doing. First word out of his mouth was a cuss word. Just kept right on going. Preached to him. Called him forth in the altar. We laid hands on him and prayed for him. Sometimes, even though a, a man or person is saved, some of that old life can stick to you. It can be. It can still be a part of your life. What the trouble is now, you've got to learn to live in the new identity that God has placed upon you rather than the old coat of the past. That's why Jesus said you don't put a new, a, 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 a new, new fabric on on an old garment because it's going to rip all the pieces. This salvation that God has given you, it's not a piece of patchwork. It's a brand new coat that you put on. And you don't get it a piece at a time. You get it all together at one time. But you've got to learn how to walk in it. You're not that old person that cusses when he bumps his toe. You're a person that praises God and loves Jesus. And the Word of God dwells inside of your heart. And also... When circumstances and situations come against your life that are not pleasant, the way that you react has to change. Because if we have the mentality of a slave, that when something bad happens in our life, our reaction is going to be to pout, to feel sorry for ourselves, to play the victim. Nothing good ever happens to me. Nobody's ever really loved me. I've been like this my whole... I knew it was too good to be true. Right here in Exodus 15, here's the story. Let me tell you this. I was going to save this for my next point. But sometimes, y'all, the greatest attacks of your life will come on the heels of the greatest victory that you've ever walked through. I've noticed we can have a powerful service in here on a Sunday. And on Monday, we can forget all about that and be wondering, does God even love me? You forgot what He said to you. You forgot the way the Spirit moved in your life on a Sunday. And now you've allowed what one person said put you to flight to bring fear and discouragement and depression into your life. Be careful. On the heels of your greatest victory can come your greatest trials or your greatest defeat. In Exodus chapter 15, we find the nation Israel. They just come through the Red Sea. That was the greatest victory they ever saw. Pharaoh that used to whip them and punish them and make them slaves for all of their life. They saw him drowned in the Red Sea. The women got their tambourines out and they began to sing. They never sang like they sang there. They never had a song of joy or of triumph or over victory. But now, all of a sudden, they got one. But listen to me. Three days later, just three days after you saw that, three days after God literally killed the person that made your life a living hell, Gave you promises. We're going to a land flowing with milk and honey. You ain't going to look for it. It's going to come looking for you. You're going to live in houses you didn't build. You're going to eat from vineyards and gardens that you didn't plant. And no enemy is going to be able to stand before you. Three days after all that happened, they didn't find any water. And then when they did find water, it wasn't what they thought it was. They couldn't drink it. It was bitter. The Bible says that they called that place Mara, for it was bitter. That's Exodus 15 and verse 23. And the Bible says in verse 24, the people murmured against Moses and said, 
What shall we drink? So in three days, they go from shouting the praises of God to why did you bring us out here in the wilderness to die? You tricked us. You You know what that is? That's the mentality of a slave. I forgot the promises of God. I forgot the promised land. I forgot what happened three days ago. Now all I know is I'm thirsty and I don't see what I want to see. That's walking in the flesh. If you walk in the flesh, you shall die. It's not that murmuring, that complaining is not bringing you closer to God. Talking bad about Moses is not going to help you. It's going to separate you from God. That is the spirit of a slave. But the next verse, verse 25, listen, Moses is acting like a mature son. A son that's walked with the Lord on the backside of the desert for 40 years. And I know now how to handle situations like that. There may be 3 million people murmuring and blaspheming God, but I'm not going to join them. I decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. The Bible says that Moses cried unto the Lord. That's the maturity. And the Lord showed him what? A tree. The Lord showed him a tree which when he had cast it into the water, the waters were made sweet and he made for them a statute and an ordinance ordinance there and he proved them. And God says, if you'll hearken diligently to the voice of the Lord your God, do what's right in his sight, give your ear to his commandments, keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon you which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. That is Jehovah Rapha. You see, in in the middle of a situation that's not good, somebody has to have the spiritual strength and the spiritual maturity to not murmur and complain, but put the tree in the middle of the bad situation. You know what the tree is a picture of? It's a picture of the cross of Jesus. In the middle of that bad situation, in the middle of this argument, in the middle of this disagreement, in the middle of this marriage that's on the rocks, in the middle of this job that I hate, in the middle of my sickness where I've been to the doctor and I've been prayed for, but I still don't feel better, in the middle of my kids are running away from God rather than coming to God instead of falling all apart. Put the tree in the middle of it and believe God to take something bitter and make it sweet. And you know what it led to? A new revelation. Not only is He Jehovah, He is Jehovah Rapha. And He promised not to make me sick, but He promised to heal me of all my diseases because I didn't murmur, because I didn't complain, even though I didn't understand it all. I chose to believe Him in the middle of that bitter situation. I walked out of it. I'm not bitter. I got a new revelation of who God is in my life. So in the midst of it, people are oppressed because they've got a wrong mindset. God didn't bring you to that bitter place to destroy you. God brought you to the middle of that bitter place to, for you to put the cross of Jesus where He took your bitterness, where He took your sin, where He took your sorrow and your disease and He bore it on Himself. Plug it in. You say you believe it. Now let's see if you really do. Will you walk in it when it don't look good? Will you walk in it when there's three million complainers and you're going to be the one to call a prayer meeting and seek the Lord and say, I know something somebody that can fix the problems that you're walking through. People are oppressed because they have a wrong mindset. Secondly, I'm trying to hurry. People are oppressed because they have attacked the enemy's kingdom and he doesn't give up easily. Turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19, we have the story of the prophet Elijah. One of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament. Look, he came to to Israel in the face of apostasy, in the face of gross sin, in the in the in, in a time when people had turned their backs on God, or they had mixed the worship of God with the worship of Baal. And so God answered with a man. God uses people. 
God don't have to have a bunch. God just needs one person that will side with Him on this is what the Lord says. Whether they feel good about it or not, whether they feel anointed or not, the Word of the Lord is right. It's true. It's settled in heaven. Heaven and earth will pass away, but the Word of God is true. He walked into the face of the king. The king's name was Ahab. He's the worst Israel ever had. And God says if he thought that was a light thing, he married a wicked woman named Jezebel. And and we talked about Jezebel Wednesday night. Jezebel here in this story was a woman. She's also a spirit that corrupts and perverts the saints of God and leads them away. She manipulates. She controls. She lies. She does everything she can to push her agenda in the kingdom of God. Very wicked, very dark, very vile. Well, old uh, prophet Elijah draws a line in the sand. Says we're going to put this to bed. If Baal is God, go ahead and serve him. But if if the Lord is God, you're going to serve him. Get the 450 prophets of Baal that eat at Jezebel's table. She's feeding all these false prophets. She's propping them up. She's taking care of them. She likes people that she can control. Alright? Meet me on top of Mount Carmel. Listen to this. On one side, Richard, there's 450 false prophets at their altar. On the other side, there's one old man around an altar that's been abandoned and broken down. It's been forsaken. Probably just a few rocks piled on top of each other. Briars and stuff growed up around it. Over here on Baal's side, it's big. It's beautiful. Everybody's over there. In the whole nation of Israel, Elijah said they're halting between two opinions. They're limping back and forth. Well, what do you think, brother? Who do you think's God? Well, I really don't know. We'll see. You'll meet plenty. We'll see how it turns out. Plenty of people like that. Plenty of people wish wishy-washy back and forth. Plenty of people that a shout after the fire falls. God's looking for people that'll stand for Him when ain't much happening. Ain't much going on. I just believe that He, His way is true. His Word is right. His salvation, His Son is the one way, truth, and the life. Nobody's going to the Father unless they come through Him. Well, the prophets of Baal, they call fire down all day. They ask for fire to be called down. Nothing ever happened. Elijah mocked them. Your God's asleep. He's gone to the bathroom. Maybe He don't hear you. He's, they cutting themselves and all kinds of stuff going on. Nothing ever happened. Elijah went over to his altar, dug a trench around it, and poured seven barrels of water on top of it. I want you to know I, I'm not the one doing this. God's going to do it. Ask God to answer him there that day. Fire came down from heaven. It burned up the, the bullock, the stones, the wood. It burned up the water. It licked up the water that was in the trench. There was nothing there left. And all of Israel knew that the Lord, that Jehovah, was the one true God. Elijah stood alone on Mount Carmel, very bold, very brave for the cause of God. God won a great victory there that day through that one man. You know what He did? He took 450 false prophets down to the creek and killed them all. Their blood ran down the stream. He delivered the nation from 450. That's boldness. Wouldn't you agree? That's a real man of God. That's iron in his soul and in his spirit. Well, if you read in chapter 19 of 1 Kings, you find... Jezebel, Jezebel sent a message to Elijah and said, So shall the gods do to me if you're not dead by this time tomorrow. In a whisper from the devil, a whisper from the enemy, Elijah began to run. He ran for his life. The Bible says that he ended up under a juniper tree and he began to ask God to kill him. God, I, I've had enough. He, he, he felt all alone the enemy had convinced him. He said that, I'm the only one that stands for God. I'm the only prophet in the land. And I've been very jealous for you, God. But, and he also had some sense in his heart that God had failed him. You know what was happening? There's oppression there. 
Elijah, do you remember the victory that you had yesterday? Do you remember when God stood with you when you were the only one standing for Him? Do you remember when you saw 450 false prophets fall at the brook and they died and people repented and they came back to God. Now at the word of one wicked woman, you're running for your life. That's oppression. The angel of the Lord came. So what are you doing here, Elijah? Why why did you end up here? I just want to die. I'm not better than my fathers. I've served God. I've done well. I believe it was a suicidal spirit. I don't want to live anymore. I just want to go to heaven, but I can't take any more of the problems on this earth. I just want to die. He says, and and the angel fixed fixed him something to eat and he got it and he ran again. Found himself under the same tree, laying there wanting to give up. But the cure was the angel of the Lord. Listen to this. A lot of times in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord was a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus came to Elijah under the juniper tree and said, Elijah, what are you doing here? I didn't call you to this place. I didn't tell you to run. He said this, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he looked and there on the ground was a cake, a baked cake, and a pitcher of water. The cake baked, it was a picture of the bread of life. It was a picture of the Word of God. If you're down, you're discouraged, you're oppressed, you've got to rise up and eat. You've got to consume the Word of God because faith comes by hearing. Hearing comes by the Word of God. You begin to ingest and digest the Word of God. And the Bible says that Elijah took that and he ran on the strength of that one meal for four days. That's the strength of God. That's the power of God. Know this, when you attack the kingdom of hell, it will attack you back. But what it is, y'all, it's lies. What could Jezebel do to Elijah? He's God's man. He's protected. But listen, the enemy will always come with a whisper, with a lie, with a thought. Instead of giving heed to that, You need to get into the Word of God and ingest it and digest it. One more place. 1 Peter chapter 5. Other people are oppressed because they're burdened down with the cares of this life. The Bible says, Jesus said, in Luke chapter 8 and verse 14, He was talking about Turn to 1 Peter 5. I'm just giving you this. Luke 8, 14. Jesus was talking about the parable of the sower. You remember how the Word of God is the seed and it's scattered on four different kinds of soil. Some of it goes on the wayside and the fowls, that's demon spirits. They come and get the Word and they, they steal it out of your heart and it never had the chance to bear fruit. That's why sometimes we can have a great service on Sunday and then by Monday, you're like Elijah. You're on the run. You're wanting to die. You don't know if you can do this or not anymore. It's the lies of the enemy and you're letting him rob the Word of God from your life. I can tell you guys, sometimes in your walk with the Lord, there's going to be pain. There's going to be discouragement. But even in that, it's not always going to feel like revival. You've just got to hold on and let the Lord see you through because in the face of adversity, and discouragement, that's where you grow. That's where you you become you, you become with great confidence in the foundation that you're standing on that God's not going to fail you. But Jesus said in Luke 4.18 that the cares of life can choke the Word of God out of your soul where it's been planted. The cares of life. Things, job, Bills. Car don't crank. Car don't want to run. What somebody said. What somebody did. The cares of this life. You know what it's looking to do? To choke the Word out in your life. 
where it was fruitful, where it was promising, that enemy looks in every avenue to choke the Word out in your life. Also, in Luke 21 and verse 34, Jesus said that the cares of life can weigh down your heart and cause you to miss the rapture. He was talking about people you need to be careful in the end time. So that your heart is not overwhelmed and overcome with the cares of this life. And the day of the Lord will catch you unaware. You know what that means? You weren't ready. The cares of life choke the Word of God out in your heart. Luke chapter 10 and verse 38. There's a story of how Jesus went to a village and He went to the house of Mary and Martha. You know this story. And it says Mary sat down at Jesus' feet and she was listening to His words. But Martha, it says, was cumbered or, or burdened with much serving. And she looked and said, God, how come Mary, you're not making Mary help me with all this stuff that needs to be done? And Jesus answered and said, Martha, Martha, you are careful and you are troubled with many things. That word careful and troubled, it means you're oppressed and you're anxious. Anxiety is building up in you and Jesus is in the house and you you don't even realize. You're worried about baking a cake. You're worried about... He's right there and He's talking, but you're not hearing Him because the enemy is having his way in your life and he's coming through a good thing. It's a good thing to serve Jesus, but it's a better thing. One thing is needful. Sit at his feet and listen to what he has to say. Jesus said one thing is needful and Mary has chosen the good part which shall not be taken away from her. 1 Peter chapter 5, just go through this quickly in verse 7. He says, cast all your care upon Him because He cares for you. Remember I said people are oppressed because of the cares of this life. It's choking out the promises of God. Their heart is divided. It's focused on other things. Jesus says, Peter says, cast all your care upon the Lord because He cares for you. Verse 8, be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. There's a reason, y'all, that those two verses are connected together. Have you ever got overburdened with things that are going on in your life and it caused you to miss time with the Lord? It causes you to miss one service at church and then another service at church and And when you really needed that, you know, you've got all that care, you've got all that burden, you really needed to be there. You really needed the fellowship with the Lord. And it seems like instead of one thing happening, two or three things happening, and before you know it, you've done drifted off to a place that you said you'd never go back to. You found yourself back with those people that you know they're not good for you, you're doing that thing, you're listening to that voice, you're right there. There's a reason that Jesus said, if you feel that care, if you feel that burden, you better give it to Him. Because if you're not careful, you'll be this boy, you'll be this child of God with a 200 pound devil sitting on top of Him. And Jesus is moving, Jesus is walking, Jesus is building the kingdom like He always does, but you can't keep up because you're burdened down with care. you you're, you're, you're weighed down with problems and now it's affecting your heart. It's affecting your worship. And the, the lion doesn't affect the strong that are walking with the shepherd. He looks for those that are lagging behind. They can't keep up. They're weak. They're a little bit bitter because this happened and, that, and before you know it, you're in His teeth and He's devouring and He is consuming your life. That's the reason, church, that we have an altar. That's the reason that we pray. That's the reason that we talk to the Lord. Because you stay in that place of oppression. You're pray for the enemy. Now I'll talk to you about the, the problem. But I want to talk to you about the cure. 
Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30, Come unto Me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take My yoke upon you and learn of Me, because I am meek and lowly of heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for My yoke is easy, My burden is light. Know what you need to do? Make a trade with God. If it's a person that's antagonizing you or bothering you, you know what you have, you know what you have to realize? I can't save anybody. I was preaching that to myself in that office this morning. I can't save anybody. And so I have to put it in the hands of the Lord. I can't change anybody. That brings a tremendous amount of pressure off of my shoulders. So when I'm not able to save that person, I'm not able to redeem that situation, it's all right because I'm not the Savior Jesus is. I just need to be what He wanted me to be in the situation and in the moment and give that person an opportunity to come to Jesus. Give it to Him. If it's a situation a problem. Lord, I don't know how I'm going to take care of this or this bill or whatever's going on in your life this week. Just give it to the Lord. Make a trade with Him. God, I'm giving You my trouble and my problem. What I want in exchange with it, God, is I want rest for my soul. Lord, I'm going to give You this yoke that's heavy and it's holding me back. And I'm giving You this burden that's weighing me down. I want one that's easy. And I want one that's light. And it's not asking for too much because that is what He said He would give you. Making a trade with you, God. Last one, listen. Colossians 3.15-17 through This is the cure. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts, which you are also called in one body, and be ye thankful. Remember last week how Pastor Lee had us just thank God for three things that He's done in your... Wasn't that powerful? Yeah. That's simple. Three things. I can do that. <laughs> right? I can, do, I can thank God for three things. Man, when I started doing that, I, I just began to weep like, my God, you've been so good to me. A lot of times, y'all will make a mountain out of a molehill. All we'll see, the Lord told me one time, all you ever see are problems and you never make it to the, to the table. We'll have one, bad, one person that's talking bad about... Turn around and look around you this morning. Look. I don't know how many people's in here. Maybe 50-something people in here. They ain't talking bad about you. They love you. They're praying for you. They're believing for you. What's it matter what one somebody has? God, I thank You that I'm surrounded by people that believe what I believe. They're going in the same direction and we're moving on with God and good things are waiting on me. Be thankful. And as you're giving God thanks, guess what's happening? All that turmoil and that chaos, it's leaving and the peace of God is ruling in your heart. I don't know how He's going to do it, y'all. I just know everything's going to be okay. Everything's going to be alright. Look in verse 16. And let the Word of God dwell in you richly in all wisdom. This goes back to what we talked about. Sowing that seed. Hold on to it. God said He is Jehovah Rapha, then I believe that. If God told Elijah to rise up and eat because there's a lot more in front of you that I've called you to do, if God said I can cast all my care upon Him because He cares for me, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing. That means building up and encourage one another in what? Psalms. Hymns. And spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father of all by Him. You know what you need to do? You need to open your mouth and you need to sing. You need to open your mouth and you need to sing a spiritual song. Don't sing, there's a tear in my beer. 
Because I'm crying for You, dear. Think, sing, Lord, Your presence is heaven to me. Oh, nothing in this world will satisfy because Jesus, You are the cup that don't run dry. Your presence is heaven to me. Oh, sing to the Lord a spiritual song. Sing to Him. Shout to Him with a voice of triumph. And I can tell you, you're going to climb out of that place of depression. You're going to climb out of that place of discouragement. You're going to climb out of that place of despair. You're going to feel that 200 pound devil or 400 pound demon. However much he weighs, you're going to feel that Goliath get off of your chest, get off of your shoulders, and you're going to see a lane to run in. And you're going to know, man, I'm almost home. I'm running my last mile home. I'm not going to be weary, defeated, oppressed, or discouraged. I'm going to move with Jesus. I'm going to run with Him. Hey, I'm going to admonish somebody else and encourage somebody else in the Lord. Sister, don't give up. We're almost home. God is good. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we're going to make it. Amen? Amen. We're going to make it. Stand to your feet this morning. We're going to exercise this. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing comes by the Word of God. But faith without work.